Greetings, everyone. This is Reverend Dr. Brian T. Mark, Sr., Founder, Chief Equity Officer at the National Training Institute on Race and Equity. So in our trainings across the country with organizations and companies, what comes up quite a bit is uh, bias in the hiring process. So today, I want to talk a little bit about how um, some mistakes or seven key mistakes that are related to bias that managers and HR make during the screening and hiring process. All right. Now, these you might have heard of, uh, you know, some of them already sort of intuitively, but I'm going to give you some feedback or some these mistakes based upon our experience with companies and organizations, um, the mistakes that they're making that's pretty consistent. Um, and then I'll hit at some solutions, uh, which you'll probably be able to pick up yourself as we go through. All right. Wonderful. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in. And again, just to give you some context, in our Break Your Bias series, uh, we have implicit bias awareness and mitigation. So awareness is what it sounds like. And mitigation is sort of when we talk about solutions. And a part of our mitigation training is a little component on the employee life cycle. So for our current partners and so forth, I'm sort of gonna extend uh, that module that you might have seen. But we have developed a completely new course called Recruiting and Retaining a Diverse Workforce. It's gonna be pretty good uh, rolling out. So this is uh, some highlights from both of those trainings. Here we go. Seven bias related mistakes managers and HR make during the screening and hiring process. Number one, <clears throat> not considering the anti-bias journey of their hiring partners or vendors. For example, search firms, temp agencies, job websites, newspapers and magazines. Let's break this down. So how many of you in your organization, agency and so forth, have used a search firm, headhunters, search firm, that sort of thing. Okay, usually these search firms are used when they have an opening for a senior position, director, executive, president, things like that. And they serve their purpose, they're, they're quite good, many of them, at identifying talent. They can keep your process pretty low key uh, without it being sort of public. They can produce a, a subset of candidates that can be really strong, so they serve a purpose. Here's a question for those who've used search firms. How did you choose your search firm? Oh, well, we used them for the last three searches. Oh, so convenience, so you've been using them so you continue to use them. Was the criteria related to uh, bias reduction or equity at all? For example, so you have three search firms, right? All high quality. You can sort of ask them about their anti-bias journey as part of your criteria. What do I mean? You say the things like, oh, how did you diversify your workforce? How did you diversify your senior leadership? Um, how did you go from point A in this year with it then had an intervention to point B? What do you think these things you've already done? You can make that part of your criteria. Folks, they're still going to provide you with the service. But if you have three search firms and one is further ahead uh, in their DEI or anti-bias journey than the other two, why not go with the one that's ahead? If that's in line with your values. Matter of fact, I'll take it deeper. You can get to a point where you have an ecosystem of aspirational partners. What do I mean? So your accounting firm that you use, the law firm that you use, whatever your stakeholders, partners, contractors, imagine you had a set of them who were all ahead of you in your organization in terms of the DEI, a bias mitigation journey, right? Folks, it's a twofer. They provide you with the service and you can pick their brain. How did you diversify your workforce? How did you diversify your board? How did this initiative work? They're not gonna charge you to tell you that. So imagine you have a set of these entities around you feeding you best practice in an ongoing basis. <laughs> You're gonna get better. That's what serious organizations do, right? Others, like for example, uh, um, uh, and that applies to temp agencies, like job websites. You know what happened? Oh, what do you use for, for recruiting? Where do you place your ads for jobs? Well, Indeed, LinkedIn, Zip Recruit, them. okay, fine. How did you choose? Oh, well, they had a promotion and so we, oh, to save some, some pennies. Some, uh, uh, folks, do you know that many of these outlets, right, the big ones, they have data. They have data on the demographics of sectors in their sort of applicant pool for particular jobs. So you can say to them, all right, here's our position. Can you tell us about the demographics, how diverse the applicant pool is for this position? They have that data. And you can fact that it in before you choose. Because if you, folks, please hear me. If you're writing somebody a check, are they gonna make money off you? You have leverage. You can say, well, yeah, we want to factor this in. This matters for us. We're paying you. You're going to get our business in sometimes an ongoing fashion. Yeah, we want to know this. And you factor that in, okay? Um, let's see, newspapers and magazines. Now, newspapers and magazines have their purpose, uh, whether it's print or digital, but they may cater to certain audiences, right? So you may say, well, um, 
you know, we, we like this. It's pretty popular. They have a lot of readers. Okay. You're trying to diversify your workforce potentially. Do you know that the readership for that magazine or newspaper is actually diverse? Right. I mean, they have those demographics, but do you have them? Right. So they're popular. They're well known. I get it. It makes sense. Okay. Um, also with magazines. Now, now, on the flip side, you can be targeted. You can say, well, I know this outlet, this newspaper, this magazine targets or caters to certain populations, subgroups, you know, in the U.S. or globally. And let's take the U.S. for now, right? For example, if you want to reach black women, you may place an ad in Essence, Essence.com, Essence Magazine, because they cater to black women, right? So you can use your powers for good, right? <laughs> but you want to have a set of those outlets, right, for a variety of groups to sort of balance things out, cast a wide net, that sort of thing. But Consider the anti-bias journey of these external partners as you go through your process. Number two, many managers and HR folks do not consider the lack of diversity or bias of current employees who submit recommendations, employer referral programs, right? What do I mean? See, uh, <laughs> employer referral programs can work under certain circumstances. What do I mean? Uh, actually, let me give you this. Let me give you this. Uh, all right. Now, some of you have heard this mantra, this thing that's being said, this saying since you were a kid, right? You heard it over and over again, but I said it and I heard it once before, right? You, 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 you've been had, you've been took, you've been bamboozled, led astray, run amok. Why? Because you've been hearing this ridiculous nonsense and you actually believed it. You know what it is? You know what it is? You know what you heard? Opposites attract. Opposites attract. No, they don't. Opposites repel. Opposites do not attract socially. Wait, what, what do I mean? All right, let's go to dating. Say you're dating, right? So opposites, okay? Say you're dating, and you know, say I'm dating somebody, right? Dating somebody, and um, and um, opposites, right? So dating somebody. I believe in God. Opposites. I believe in God. She believes in the devil, right? Um, I believe in monogamy, being with one person. She sleep with everybody. Uh, I believe in respecting elders. She's cursing up my grandmother. Opposite. Eh, that's not attractive. I, I, all right, okay. Let's be honest real conversation think about right now your top two values in life your top two values your family your faith the environment whatever think about your top two values in life right you got it think about it right now got it okay imagine seriously dating or being married to somebody who was the opposite on those values wouldn't last See, I, 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 I understand, you know, the, the, the notion, right? And so people, when, folks, the science is clear. When it comes to long-term friendships and romantic relationships, partnerships, marriages, that sort of thing, what, what works is a core of similarities with differences around the edges. That works. Opposites of the long-term do not work, okay? Now, imagine I'm in a workplace, right? I got, I'm, I'm going to refer my friends, my network, to this, to, to this position. My network, my friends because I'm drawn to similarity, are gonna likely be like me. Similar race, education level, background, we have things in common. So if I'm in an organization that is not diverse, it lacks diversity, and you have these employees referring their, their friends and networks, it's gonna remain uh, uh, lacking diversity. It's gonna just reinforce itself. Now, on the flip side, right, you can use that to your advantage. If you're already diverse, and people are referring their people who are similar to them, you're gonna remain diverse if you start out that way. Do you see how this works? Okay. So the employer fellow programs, because we know word of mouth happens. Now, to be clear, the employer fellow programs can be effective because I, I might be a high performing employee and I have a friend similar to me at another organization who could be a great fit to come over to this new position. That can happen. All right. I'm just saying factor in these similarity sort of things as we go forward and making these recommendations and even considering applicants. All right, number three mistake that some uh, uh, folks make, they don't creatively expand recruitment efforts, creatively. Professional associations, right? For example, okay, homework, homework. Uh, um, when you get a chance, here, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to go online, right? And I want you to just Google, do a search on National Association of Fill in, the, fill in the demographic, fill in the occupation. Example, NASA Association of Hispanic Accountants, NASA Association of Asian Attorneys. Just pick, like it's crazy, just pick. It's, it's, it's amazing how things pop up, okay? But so if you wanna cast a wide net, sometimes in NASA associations, again, you can include in a suite of advertising outlets for your positions that could yield a diverse candidate pool. HBCUs, Historically Black Colleges and Universities. So I work at Morehouse, which is a Historically Black College um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, lots of talent 
at HBCUs and minority serving institutions in general. But in Atlanta, we have the Atlanta University Center, Morehouse Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, Morris Brown um, I, Interdenominational Theological Center, and Morehouse School of Medicine, right? So we have a lot of talent down here in a variety of ways. This is a great place, a bastion of talent for people to recruit. Now, if they know about it, so some organizations are pretty savvy, been recruiting in the AU Center for decades. Others are just sort of finding out and getting hip to this whole thing. But the notion is, are you willing to step out of your comfort zone with glitters, you know, with seems like these great schools? I right, actually, homework, thought experiment. Thought experiment. Okay, you ready? Imagine in your organization, your agency, right, there was a position that opened up for which a four-year college degree is needed. Okay, and you can recruit from any two schools in the country for that position. What two schools would you pick? So what two schools across the entire U.S., where would you go to recruit for uh, job applicants for a position in your agency department unit that required a four-year college degree? You got it? I want you to think of these two schools. Do this. You got it? Two schools. Okay? Now tell me this. In coming up with those two schools, did you, be honest, did you actually think about or read an analysis or reflect an analysis of high-performing people who stay in your organization or department for a long time, high-performing over the long term, and then reverse engineer to figure out where do they go to college? And that was the basis of your, of your selections. Probably not. That's called being evidence-based, by the way. Why? What is a stronger predictor of future performance than past performance? So if you have people in your organization who stay for a long time, who are high performing, you might have a sleeper school that's feeding you those types of people disproportionately. See, some of y'all are seduced by, you know, these rankings and brands and all this other stuff. That's wonderful. There are wonderful, great, high ranking schools out there. No shade. What I'm saying is that does not always equate to an individual being high performing over the long term in your department, in your city, in your county, in your company. What do I mean? Say, for example, you have somebody from a top rated school, right? And they, they start working with you. And for you, I mean, for them, your position, your job, their job with you is a stepping stone into something higher. So they stay with you, you know, one or two years, then they're gone. Imagine somebody else from a great state school comes in. And for them, you are their dream job. They stay with you for 25 years, high performing. Who would you rather have? Okay. So the notion is, let's look at our data and see what the data is telling us. Okay. All right. So. Uh, these don't, I mean, again, state schools, other schools, again, I'm not throwing shade on highly ranked schools. I'm just saying expand your thinking, cast a wider net, and run the analysis and see if there's some evidence that suggests we may be missing out on talent for places we might not normally suspect. All right. Number four, allowing triggers of bias unrelated to the job to remain on the resume or application. All right. For example, you get a resume, names on resumes. Do you know that names on resumes? can increase or decrease the likelihood of being called in for an interview? Yes. Homework, homework, just Google name bias on resumes by race. 20 studies pop right up. Here's your bottom line. Resumes with ethnic sounding names, Jose, Malik, Aisha, less likely to be called in for an interview than those same resumes copy and pasted word for word with mainstream sounding names, John, Michael, Allison. Same resume, copy and pasted word for word, different outcomes. Name bias, folks. It's a thing. Please understand, there are tens of thousands of people right now in the U.S. at a systemic disadvantage when they apply for a job based upon a characteristic over which they had zero control. Their name. How many of you named yourselves as infants? Exactly. They didn't either. Names are social. We get them from other people, but we have to live with the consequences of them. Name bias, folks. Pretty interesting. Okay. All right. Next, what do we have? Address. Okay, you might think, oh, address, you got to know the address. Why? What matters when you're hiring somebody, right? What are, education, experience, qualifications, their address. You mean to tell me to determine if somebody is a fit for a job, you must know their address down to their apartment number? How is that relevant? Why? Because it could be the basis of bias. It could be a trigger. What do I mean? You get the, you get the resume, you say, look at the address. Oh, they live in that neighborhood. Bias. Bias, just like that. Completely unrelated could be the basis of bias. Social and political organization. All right, let's be honest. Say you are a hiring manager, right? And you look at a resume and it says, this person while in college was the president of the Young Republicans Club, of the Young Democrats Club, the opposite of you. Whatever you are, opposite the president, okay? You mean to tell me at some level, at some level, it doesn't occur, you don't think about, ooh, 
Uh, is this person a fit for our culture? I don't know. President? Be honest. All right? Nothing to do with the job. Okay? Uh, year graduation. Now, be honest. Have you ever had this? All right, tell the truth. Tell the truth. You look at a resume. Look at a resume. And you see the year that somebody graduated, high school or college, and you found yourself trying to calculate how old they were. Okay, I've done it too. It's okay, fine. Why do you do it? Well, I need to know how old they are and if they have breaks in their work experience and so forth. Eh, that's none of your business. People have breaks in their work career of all types of reasons. You know, they had kids at a terminal illness, their parents had a terminal illness, they started a business. People, all types of reasons, okay? Does it affect education, experience, qualifications, the ability to do a job? Because that could be the basis of age bias. All right, photo. Do you know that for some applications, they attach a photo to the application? You don't think that seeing how somebody looks could be the basis of bias can trigger? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Next mistake. Number five, seeing or meeting applicants too early in the screening process. You say, of course, well, we need to meet an applicant. But right, well, tell me this. At what point in the process is it absolutely necessary that you see the applicant? Well, we have to interview them. That's true. Right? You have to interview them, but you can do that on Zoom, cameras off. Right? What is the purpose of the interview? That's a great exercise, by the way. You and your team talk about it. The purpose of the purposes of the interview, rank them, right? Because you can do, much, you can collect a lot of information, like, like uh, well, I need to flesh out what's on the resume or the cover letter. You can do that on Zoom cameras off. Why? Because when the camera is off, you can hear the voice, and sometimes you can tell race or ethnicity, but you cannot hear height. You cannot hear weight. You cannot hear skin tone. You cannot hear attractiveness, all of which have been shown to be bases of bias. But you can still get the information that you need. I would argue you could probably do about 80% of the screening work before you even see the person. I mean, eventually you got to see them, make sure they dress appropriately, they ain't crazy, okay, fine. Right? But the notion is, if you've done 80% of the work with rubrics and rankings and, and scores and all that, you're not going to say, well, now that I see them, I'm going to go back and change my score. Probably not going to do that. Okay? All right, so make sure I understand you must meet them eventually. But if you could take a step back, look at your process and say, when is it absolutely necessary that we physically see them? Okay? Number six, engaging in inconsistent interview energy or comfort. That might sound strange. Timing and common interest. Okay, so many of you conduct panel interviews, groups, right? Four or five people, whatever, and there's, there's a, a, and the applicant. And then you have one-on-one, -on -one. you may have combinations. But let's just take the panel, the group interview. Okay, I'm a social psychologist, folks. And I'm telling you, it is virtually impossible to duplicate the dynamic, the energy, and many nuances of a, a social sort of interaction uh, with a candidate over time. You could barely do it over the course of the same week. What do I mean? Say it's Monday morning, right? And the, uh, the, the, the panelists come in and they, they, they know each other, right? So they, how's your weekend? They slap each other on the back. Hey, feeling good, feeling rested. It's Monday morning, feeling pretty good, right? Uh, by, by Friday morning, Friday afternoon, they're spent. They're done. They want to get the interviews over, right? Oh, by the way, pro tip, pro tip. My recommendation in terms of uh, job interview slots Best job interview slot, my perspective, 10 o'clock, Monday morning. Great slot. Why? It's, you don't want 9 o'clock. People come in, they're late, they're disheveled, that sort of thing, right? And at 10 o'clock, they're not hungry yet. 10 o'clock, best, yeah. You interview on a Friday afternoon, you're not getting that job. I, I mean, you know, I'm saying like that, but I'm saying it, it, it plays a role. It plays a role, okay? Okay, so also, uh, in an in interview, and, and don't try to be all uh, personal. Some of y'all in an interview, oh, what do you like to do in your downtime? Oh, you crochet? I'll crochet too. Bias. Bias. Now you got a connection. You have a common interest. Now you say, ooh, I can imagine. I've been wanting to start a crochet club for two years. They could come in. All of that. Nothing to do with the job. Right? That sort of thing. So if you're going to ask people, what do you do in your downtime? Those in, in, uh, sort of informal questions, do that with everyone. And you keep on asking questions until you connect at some level. Because if somebody connects with one of the people on the panel, they're more relaxed, they're more warm, it's a more warm environment, they get better fluid answers. They perform better in the interview. Folks, you got to understand, I'm not saying you, panelists are bad people. I'm just giving you the interpersonal dynamics of what can happen. Okay? So more, more uh, cold or awkward. If you don't make a connection and vice versa, if you do. All right. And finally, number seven, providing different opening offers and an unwillingness or willingness to negotiate. All right. So, so <laughs> I had a colleague of mine. She's a medical school. She finished medical school and finished a residency, I should say, finished residency. And her and somebody from her same residency program get hired at this new hospital. Right. And about a year, a little over a year into their residency, they have a conversation. And so they're discussing their salaries. And so they talk about when they were hired, what they were paid. And the guy says, you know, man and woman, you know, so the guy says that he would pay a certain amount. So he was paid about 
10, 15% more than she was. Same residency, same qualifications, things are the same. And she felt some kind of way about that. She goes to her mentor, right? Who's a male, a physician, right? Attending or something like that. And says, um, tells, tells her what happened. And so he says, oh yeah, I was on that committee. Yeah, so we, get, we paid him a little more because he was the breadwinner for his family. Yes. Is that fair? I mean, intellectually you understand that, but if, what if you were that woman? Or what if that was your daughter or your sister or your mom? Do you see? Okay, all right. Again, it's not evil conspiracies, folks, right? Um, some folks, you're not gonna believe this. Some f managers are less willing to negotiate with certain people for a certain racial group, a certain gender, whatever, because they feel, well, you're lucky we're even hiring you. You're lucky to be here. You take what we offer. Like, it's, it, it's uh, they almost find it offensive that certain people will push back on salary when negotiating based upon the biases that a manager or HR may have towards them. I, I'm not in your organization, fine. Okay, all right, okay, right. Okay, so folks, seven mistakes that uh, bias-related mistakes that can be made during the hiring and screening process by managers in HR, okay? So we like to share these sorts of uh, videos because when I'm in my trainings, our trainings range anywhere from two to three hours. And sometimes I'm just, I talk really fast. My people know that. And I'm not able to cover everything. So these videos are a nice supplement. Uh, if you haven't worked with Entire before, please shoot us an email. The website will be in, in the, descript the description below. Uh, please subscribe, follow us, that sort of thing. So we're trying to build the channel, provide a lot of quality content, uh, just to complement what we're doing uh, across the country for companies, nonprofits, those sorts of things. Our goal is to improve the outcomes uh, or of individuals and organizations, opportunities and outcomes, and to mitigate bias whenever and wherever we can. All right, folks. So with that, I'm going to pause. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, until next time, peace and blessings. Have a great day.